Um, so I'm going to um, <clears throat> begin and let's begin in prayer. So Lord, we just thank you once again. You are the source of all things, your creator. And God, we just pray tonight you'd help us to understand concepts, understand their depth, and in a way, we'll see how far we've come, even as a nation. So God, we just thank you, God, that um, your truth is secure, it is powerful, and we ask you to help us to understand even greater depth on personal property. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, once again, I'm going to uh, begin here our, believe it or not, we're on lesson 13. And as we look at some of the review, we are now in the fifth and final section on two lessons on personal property. Uh, next week, we are going to review um, a couple slides of all the major premises that we have been discussing, the major pillars of a biblical worldview. And then we'll um, go into what to do with this. What do you do after you've taken this course? Uh, what are some practical things? And we'll take a lesson from history uh, as well. So um, that will be, of course, next week. And um, I know several are looking for a final exam, but maybe I'll mail or email that to you. But <laughs> at any rate, um, I'm going to take several things from this lesson, from the notebook and the paperback book. And um, I'm going to highlight some of the things. I'm going to go in a little more depth in some other ones of things and uh, what I've taught in the past. One of the first key concepts here is the origin of private property. It makes all the difference in the world when you talk about economics and property on where it begins. Where did we come up with, where did the earth come from? Where did land come from? And of course, we know from a scriptural point of view, the earth is the Lord's. As it says in Psalm 24, one, and that's also quoted in 1 Corinthians 10, 26, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So the earth is ultimately owned by God as creator. He created it. And the one who creates a product owns the product, has first title to the product. They're the one who uh, expended the labor. And it's clear that God labored to create the earth because we know he rested from his labors on the seventh day, which means that he labored the other six. The fullness includes all the productions of the world and all the people. Now, we would say all the things that have produced, all the technology, all the things from the earth that have been produced by the labor and invention of individuals from private property is for the Lord. It's, uh, he may not even, uh, God, obviously there are things that are produced and used for evil purposes. Of course, God does not condone the using of those things for control or tyranny or for evil purposes, but God is the source. Important to recognize that. As Genesis 1.27 said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And that singular and plural is reflected in the Hebrew. And then John 1, 3 and 4, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Again, very important to note that the idea of private property comes from God himself. We could go on as Ecclesiastes 3, 14 and 15 says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which is has already been, and what it is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. So in other words, God knows where things have come from, where they are going, but he requires accountability. So if we are stewards of property, if we own anything, we're sub-owners, we're not the ultimate owners, which means we must give an account for everything God has given us, how we have managed it, and we'll give an account to the original owner. That's why when 1 Chronicles 29, 11 says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven 
and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. Uh, when, we, when we look at this, um, John Locke, who is that English um, philosopher on civil government who took his cue from the scriptures, he begins his entire study of civil government in Genesis chapter 1. And he says this in his book of civil government, whether we consider reason, which tells us that men being once born have a right to their preservation and consequently to meat and drink such other things as nature affords for their substance or revelation, which gives us an account of those grants God made of the world to Adam and to Noah and his sons, tis very clear that God, as King David says in Psalm 115, 16, has given the earth to the children of men. So John Locke says, even if we didn't have the scriptures, we'd know that if we're created by God, we have a right to use the earth to help us continue to survive. That the preservation of our life is a godly trait because we're created by God to live. But he said the revelation, which is the Bible, tells us clearly that God has given the earth to the children of men. He has given us the earth to inhabit. When you think of the Garden of Eden, and you think of this as the first personal private property owned by God, given to Adam and Eve, all what we call seven major economic and biblical principles are illustrated in the story of the Garden of Eden. It's a great overview. I begin with this in an economics course for students. We, we examine the Garden of Eden and we talk about the economics, the property, the value of the Garden of Eden. First of all, think of labor. They put, a God put Adam and Eve into the garden to dress it. That word in Hebrew means to labor, to work. It's the work ethic. They were given a work ethic before sin. Work is not a result of sin. Work is a result of creation. God worked and we want to be like him and we work. So there's a work ethic principle. It's a love of labor and productivity but also to keep the garden. And that Hebrew word means to manage it, to preserve the production of it, to hedge it about in section by section. So Adam and Eve had to decide, we're gonna work a certain portion of the garden. We don't have any idea how large it was, but we do know that um, they worked section by section and they managed, they tilled, they developed, they improved the resources God had given them. Uh, liberty. We know that Adam and Eve were given freedom in the garden. They could eat of every tree in the garden except one. So they were given the freedom to choose. And the idea of free choice is the basis of God's productivity and private property. What are you going to do with your property? However big or small it is, whatever you own, what do we do with what we've owned? We have a free choice for that and we'll give account for that. The consequences, uh, uh, God told him, if you do eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. You'll die instantly spiritually, but if physically you'll die. You were made to live forever, but you will die. So there are consequences. In other words, in God's economic environment, in God's productivity of private property, we are free to fail. We're free to make wrong decisions. You see, today, people, the state doesn't want anyone free to fail. That's why they, they, they're the ones that are supposed to subsidize everything. But we can fail. When we make poor choices, there's an accountability of failure, meaning we learn from our mistakes. And planning. God said to Adam, it's not good that you be alone. God did, Adam didn't even come up with that idea totally on his own. Yeah, all the animals came before him and God says, look, it's not good for you to be alone. Here's my plan. Learn to plan with me. Learn to, to, uh, to deal with that plan and to, and to judge the plan and then execute the plan. Also in the garden was the idea of categorizing, bringing everything into order. Adam named every creature, gave it a name. And those names meant to categorize by their differences and similarities. And of course, the idea in the garden of Eve being brought to Adam, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, a voluntary covenant to begin a family. 
And businesses throughout the Bible are the expression of a family's, a family business. And that even is applied to single individuals as well because they carry on a family legacy. Now, you have to need to realize that uh, you and I, that uh, when John Locke was writing these ideas in the 16, late 1600s, they were very unpopular in Europe because Europe had uh, gone the way of more of a communal or what we would, we would call it today, a socialistic economic view of private property. They had, um, they had gone backwards from their peak. Believe it or not, the peak of England's Christian history was 900 AD with King Alfred. That was the most biblically based Christian society in England's history. From that time on, she began to move a bit backwards. And you move backwards toward the state, taking more and more control, more and more governing authority. And that means the people own less and less. But notice what John Locke said when he was looking back to creation and saying that England should restore its Christian heritage. And of course, he did have to run for his life for writing these things. He said, God, who has given the world to men in common, has also given them reason to make use of it to the best advantage of life and convenience. Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Whatsoever then he removes out of the state of nature and hath provided and left in it, he has mixed labor with it and joined to it something that is his own and thereby by makes it his property. This labor being the unquestionable property of the labor. Now, here's what John Locke proposed in his book. He said in creation, theoretically, Adam and Eve had the borders of the Garden of Eden, but technically they were the only two people. They could have expanded. Maybe if they had been obedient without the fall, they could have expanded far beyond the borders of Eden. And everything else was simply created by God. It was in a state of nature, a state of freedom. Anyone could own that property. Now, before there's a civil government where you have a private property deed, before there's any aspect of that, uh, you have a right by labor to remove something out of the state of nature. You could take a fruit off of a piece of tree if it's not previously owned by somebody else. And it's kind of there. He's just theoretically saying, if you're the only one on the planet, you could do that. And when you expend the labor to pick the fruit, you are welcome to eat it because you are that labor is giving you a natural title. Now, of course, that's not true. You can't just go on somebody else's property and pick that fruit that's not yours. He's talking about at the beginning of creation. Now, this is very important because this gives us the contrast between Marx and Marxist ideas of labor, which didn't start with Karl Marx, by the way. They go all the way back to the garden, as we've mentioned. But Marx refined this in his, his uh, Communist Manifesto of 1849, and then also his uh, book Das Kapital, or the idea of capital in uh, 16... Uh, uh, 67 or 8. When he, uh, 1867, excuse me. Now, one of the things he does is this. Just I'm going to make it very simple. This is how he defines labor, the amount of hours it takes to feed, clothe, and house a worker. In other words, he said it's the bare survival. In other words, your labor is worth merely your survival. And because the workers are all victimized, see, in his idea, the premise is every worker is cheated because they're not as rich as the owner. And if every worker is cheated, who is the umpire that's to come in and force the owner to properly treat the worker? And that's, of course, the state. And so the state must set a minimum wage. Now, the idea of a minimum wage had been around before, but Karl Marx really refines this and says that the state must demand that you pay a worker a minimum amount to survive, even if he doesn't labor well and hardly ever works. Because you see the idea is then, but what about the greedy owner? Well, what if they sell their product for too high a price? So what does Marx say there? The state must come in and set a maximum price. Now, if the state says you can't sell a product for more than a certain amount, and you have to pay your workers no less than a certain amount, do you know that leaves very little profit in between and businesses can't be profitable? Well, biblical labor is just the opposite. 
It's the attitude one has toward work. You're willing to expend energy to produce. You love work. You don't consider yourself a victim. You appreciate the fact that you can work. It is a positive attitude toward work. This is one of the biggest problems we have in America. We have a negative attitude toward work because we want everyone else to do it for us. The owner and worker sets the wage voluntarily in an agreement. Listen, this is what I'll pay you per hour. What if the person you agree to pay per hour, now this is in a biblical environment of a free market system. What if the worker you pay works so much better than you ever thought? I mean, they do such a better job. How do you say thank you? You raise their wage. But if you're forced to pay everyone the same amount, you don't have that extra money to reward the good worker. And this is the problem. And then the market sets the price by supply and demand. So if someone overcharging for something, people just won't buy it. They have the freedom to buy it or not buy it. See, in a biblical idea, which started in the Garden of Eden, even after the fall, for however long they were still in the garden before they got kicked out, this idea of the market setting the price was very clearly given by implication. Because soon there were more and more people as they had children. And the whole idea is that you, uh, if you charge too much, someone else is going to produce the product for cheaper and they'll have it because you're never supposed to force anyone to buy a product. It's supposed to be your choice. This is what productivity is all about. This is what labor is all about. Labor is the unspoken true root of private property. In fact, we see this when we look at Webster's 1828 dictionary on property. He says the exclusive right of possessing, enjoying, and disposing of a thing, ownership. In the beginning of the world, the creator gave to man dominion over the earth. Isn't it amazing? Webster always goes right back to the Bible in defining his terms. This is the foundation of man's property in the earth and all its productions. Prior occupancy of the land and of wild animals gives to the possessor the property of them. The labor of inventing, making or producing anything constitutes one of the highest and most indefeasible titles to property. Property is also acquired by inheritance, by gift or by purchase. It is one of the greatest blessings of civil society that the property of citizens is well secured. You see, property is the external expression of our liberty. It doesn't mean we all will own the same amount of property. It doesn't mean it'll all be worth the same. But by our labor, it's our labor that will demonstrate to others our attitude and our good attitude in that regard. So when we think of the Declaration of Independence, notice this, that when the phrase, they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we know from Jefferson's original draft, and we know from just weeks prior to this, Jefferson borrowed a phrase from the Virginia Declaration of Rights, June 12, 1776, which said, with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. In other words, the pursuit of happiness was simply a phrase, an eloquent phrase that meant property that an individual has the freedom to acquire property and use it as they see fit. Now, obviously, if you use it to take away someone else's rights, you use it and you destroy others' property by use. If you misuse it, you lose it. But the idea is you have a stewardship, accountability, and that's the purpose of property. It's to bless, it's to bless others, it's to be productive, and it's to be a blessing to other people. So we see that property was the outworking of life and liberty. It was the, uh, the total purpose for which uh, God gave freedom. Now, we'd have to ask this question today. What kind of property was the Declaration actually referring to? Well, Webster defines a certain kind of property that's no longer in dictionaries. Uh, very few even have the word. You can still find it online. I checked even today because sometimes these things change. And it's the word allodial. Uh, in my classes, I'd go into this in some detail, but allodial means pertaining to allodium, meaning freehold, free or re of rent or service, held independence of a lord paramount, opposed to the word feudal. 
Now, this concept is rooted in the common law of England dating all the way back to King Alfred. The idea is that if you owned an allodial piece of property, that meant nobody could tax it. Nobody has any claim on it but yours. It is yours and it's free to give to your children and grandchildren. There are no strings attached. You get it unless, of course, you misuse it yourself. <laughs> All land was originally allodial from the Garden of Eden. Now, feudal is the opposite idea. It's pertaining to feuds or fiefs or fees. Feudal rights as services, feudal tenures. In other words, you use a piece of property for a fee, meaning you're not the ultimate owner. When William the Conqueror in 1066 invaded England and conquered England, the uh, French dictators turned the allodial land of England into feudal land owned by the king. They simply said, now that we own this, now the king owns all the land. No, the Saxons actually owned the land allodially, but now the king did. It became the key of the French versus the Saxons. If you've ever read the novel Ivanhoe, it clearly depicts this, this concept. The concept of the king owning the land now since 1066 uh, on all the explored countries under the kings of the 1600s and 1700s, they assumed that any land that was discovered from the pilgrims and Puritans to anyone else was owned by the King of England. Do you notice that he would, he would want the explorer to simply put the flag of the other nation and somehow magically the new land was owned by the king? How'd that happen? Uh, this, is, uh, this began to be implemented in 1760 by King George III. And folks, this is one of the real origins of the American Revolution. When the King of England declared that he owned all the land of the 13 colonies, it was the King's Highway. Do you know that the colonial uh, and pastors would say, no, it's the King of Kings Highway. It's not the King of England's. And of course, here's Thomas Jefferson, just so you understand this, his summary view of the rights of British America, inspired by the Boston Tea Party, he wrote this. America was not conquered by William the Norman, nor its land surrendered to him or any of his successors. Possessions there are undoubtedly of the allodial nature. It is time there for us, for us to lay this matter before his majesty and to declare that he has no right to grant lands of himself. From the nature and purpose of civil institutions, all the lands within the limits which any particular society has circumcised around itself are assumed by that society subject to their allotment only. This may be done by themselves, assembled collectively, or by their legislature, to whom they may have delegated sovereign authority. So Jefferson is saying, listen, none of the lands were owned by the King of England. They were owned by God, and we are the stewards. You see, this is important because this gives the original of private property. This is the origin of what it really meant at the time. And this gave rise to the right currency. See, currency is just a medium of exchange. That's all money is. It's a medium of exchange, and it means that when you can't barter directly, you can use some other commodity to do it. Now, listen, everything has been used for money in history. Animals have been used. Uh, cattle have been used. Uh, different, uh, different, any commodity at all have been used to trade uh, freely because people, they, that's how they barter. However, the Bible indicates that silver and gold is one of the surest foundations for an economic system because it keeps its value over generations. And also it fits the five areas of what makes money most practical. It's divisible. Now you see, when the Constitution says that the federal government can coin money, that simply means put it into coin shape, stamp it. Uh, the mining was all done privately initially. It was durable. It stood the test of time. It has constant value. Do you know that the amount of silver dollars that George Washington had to use to buy his new suit to take the oath of office in April of 1789 will buy a brand new suit today? The exact same silver dollar. In other words, that's how value, even though the fiat currency or the paper money or the digital money is much higher because of inflation, the silver retains its value and the gold. It's transportable, can be easily carried. 
far better than doing that's why cattle never lasted as you can't divide cattle up you can't say you can't use birds you can't this, this was became the best commodity it was easily recognizable hard to counterfeit it was scarce enough difficult enough to mine so that it's not easily produced all these things meant that at the time of the american revolution they wanted to go back to this because the counterfeit currency though the the um not worth a pl uh, uh, a nickel, so to speak, they had this, the currency of the continental during the revolution was not backed by silver and gold. So it had no, no true lasting value. Stores wouldn't even take it. Isaiah 122 says this, that when your silver has become dross, that's an indication of God's judgment of a nation. Uh, by the way, that simply meant that the silver, when it's melted down, is as other substances put into it so the person can cheat you. And the silver is not truly 0.999 fine silver, and it's dross. That's a judgment upon a nation. Folks, we have to realize that even our currency, and now our currency, inflation is soon to come because obviously we're not only just printing paper money without any silver or gold backing, we're now printing digital currency with not, not even paper backing. So we're in some real trouble. And I would say that uh, as God's design, as we go through difficulties, you're going to see a massive correction. And I pray I'm still around to see it and living, but you never know. And that will mean the correction will always go back to gold and silver as probably a basis for the economy. So property, not just property, but its external symbol of currency is a key incentive for the Dominion cultural mandate. The freedom formula implemented by people after the fall, this is a simple formula for economic freedom in the purpose for which you have property. Natural resources plus human energy times tools, that means all types te technology equals your personal welfare. Now this was simply put by Charles Wolfe, a great economic historian that many of us knew uh, for years. It created competition between the lazy and the productive. For instance, God gives us natural resources. You can sit and just look at the trees all you want. But if you own a piece of property, you might want to develop it. If you cut down a portion of your trees on your property, if you turn it into a garden and you produce fruit and you produce fruit that you can sell and products that you can sell in the market, you have made a profit. You have produced on that property. You have used your human energy. You've used axes, chainsaws. So you've used tools which which exponentially improves your human labor, and you've improved your own welfare. However, what if it's somebody else, and I sit and look in a lawn chair at my um, property and just stare at the trees, hoping they will feed me? Well, you know, that's not gonna happen. The guy right next door is building a home, he's had the garden, he's producing a business, and I'm not. This is where the idea of competition comes because God wants us to compete against the sin nature. He wants that to be able to be done voluntarily without force. The scripture says, he who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great waster, a destroyer. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor, and for lack of justice, there's waste. In other words, there's food right there. If I would just develop the land, I could eat well, but instead uh, it may lie fallow. Now that doesn't mean every person that's for, poor is poor because of their own lack of stewardship, but God does say character plays a major role here. And for lack of justice, there is waste. In other words, if there's not true justice, a civil government will waste huge amounts of money that could be done better in the private sector, do you think? This is very clear. So we find out that now, this is, is key because as R.J. Rushdoony says, God established man in the possession of property under God as a basic aspect of the life of the family, and as an essential to the economy of the family. The basic principle is this. The biblical law protects the family and its property from interference by the state. The family depends on property for its material independence, and property depends on the family for its meaning and protection. This relationship, although distorted and misrepresented, has been seen by socialists. As witness Frederick uh, Engel's study, he's, the, he's now the compatriot to Marx. For such men, the abolition of private property requires the abolition of the family. See, Marx and Engels knew that if they abolished private property, that everything would be owned by the state. 
you have to abolish the family as well. And that's exactly what they wanted to do. But let's take for a moment uh, the eighth and tenth commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. These are key commandments that affirm the private protection of property. Matthew Henry's commentary on these are, is excellent. And it's quoted by Russ Walton in this lesson. The eighth commandment forbids us to rob ourselves of what we have by sinful spending or of the use and comfort of it by sinful sparing and to rob others by removing the ancient land box or house or field forcibly by you know, clandestinely overreaching bargains, not restoring what is borrowed or found, withholding just debts, rents, or wages, and which is worst of all, to rob the public in coin or revenue, or that which is dedicated to the service of religion. See, ancient landmarks are both spiritual, as, as Matthew Henry says, and physical. See, if we don't use the property we've been given, our talents, our labor, our giftings, internally first, conscience, and then the property we own, we're not fulfilling God's total destiny. And again, it has nothing to do with the amount we may own or wealth. It's quality. And of course, the 10th commandment, uh, Matthew Henry goes on, the 10th commandment strikes at the root. The foregoing command implicitly forbids all desire of doing that which will be an injury to our neighbor. This forbids all inordinate desire of having that which will be a gratification to ourselves. St. Paul, when the grace of God caused the scales to fall from his eyes, perceived that his law, thou shalt not covet, forbade all those irregular appetites and desires, which are the beginnings of all sin that is committed to us. Do you know that covet itself, to covet, that 10th commandment covered all other the commandments. Because the idea is to get what we want without expending any labor to have someone else forcibly have to give it to us. It's actually a violating of covetousness. So when a civil government forcibly takes from someone their productivity and distributes it as they see best to somebody else, it's violating the eighth and the 10th commandments because it's wrong to steal your neighbor's property, but it's become no longer wrong for a government to steal its citizens' property. And that's a major problem. And of course, only Christianity and Christ within can heal the heart and help us steward our conscience as the most sacred of all our property. Because we've come such a long way away from these principles as a nation, the only way back is a massive revival and awakening. Well, here's some illustrations historically that might help you and I to understand this. The pilgrims, they came to economic liberty in 1623. You see, Bradford wrote the experience that was had in this common course and condition, its under years, and that amongst godly and sober men, that the taking away of property and bringing in community into a commonwealth would make them happy and flourishing, as if they were wiser than God. See, William Bradford said, see, they inherited this. They never chose this. The investors that financed the Pilgrim voyage had forced them into a contract at the last minute that meant all their productivity had to be communally owned. So no matter how hard you worked in the field, you got the same amount someone else did who hardly worked at all. And so Bradford says, you, they think this was something that, that would make them wiser than God. No, that's not true. And see, the picture on the left is just of a common field, but the one on the right is their individual gardens behind each home. This was added to it. In fact, this is what Bradford goes on to say. The governor, with the advice of the chiefest amongst them, gave way that they should set corn every man for his own particular, and so assigned every family a parcel of land, according to the proportion of their number. This had very good success, for it made all hands very industrious. So as much more corn was planted than otherwise might have been, the women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set the corn which before would allege weakness and inability, whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. See, a lot of the women said, look, I, I can't go back into the field. I work all day long and I don't get anything as a result of that. It's just given away to somebody else. So Bradford had the courage to break with that system 
and go to a system closer to the scriptures. And this, now let me tell you, they went from 26 acres the first year to maybe a close to 60 the second year. But the moment they went to private gardens, they now went to 180 acres. They tripled their production immediately when going to a private system of owning your own garden and having an incentive in that way. And another good, con a good confirmation of this is the Puritan economic theory that was very clear. Economic theory in England was that you had a common field that everybody shared and the government set the wages for the earner and set the prices for the products. This was the England the pilgrims sailed from. And when the Puritans came here, they replicated the English form of the common field. We might call it a precursor to socialism, though the word socialism, of course, was not in vogue at that time. Think about this. After the Saugus Ironworks, a great contrast to the pilgrims, was formed in 1646, the government set the wages for all the workers at the iron, ironworks. And the government set the price for the product, the iron. A just price was set by the government, not by the market, but by the government itself. And, and the wage ceiling was set. You had to pay the worker a certain amount. This is what Governor John Winthrop says was the result of that economic system. The court having found by experience that it would not avail by any law to redress the excessive rates of laborers and workmen's wages. For being restrained, they would either remove to other places where they might have more, or else being able to live by planting and other employments of their own, they would not be hired at all. It was therefore referred to the several towns to set the rates among themselves. This took better effect, so that in a voluntary way, by the counsel and persuasion of the elders, an example of some who led the way, they were brought to more moderation than they could be by compulsion, but it held not long. See, the whole idea was, once you get government involved in the marketplace, you do not allow the free voluntary choice of people to express their creativity on the creation that God has given them in their productivity. The Saugus Ironworks went out of business in 1670. This, the people who owned it could not continue the profit because they have to make enough profit to reinvest Unlike what Marx said, he said, see, the owner owns more than you do. Yes, they do, but they have more responsibility than you have. He left that out. And the whole idea was to exaggerate the victimization and then go to revolution as a solution. And we have this. Listen, Governor Winthrop and others were saying, hey, this doesn't work to have the state do it. It's far better to have individuals local control in it. Well, they learned that a few decades after the pilgrims had learned that. The interesting thing about this is how do we then preserve our property? What do we do today? Well, first we can begin, as we've said before, to endeavor to keep a clean conscience. That's where it begins. Our first property to steward is our conscience before God and before one another. And to guard our attitude against coveting anyone else's property. And whether it's uh, what we think they, they have that we'd like to have, because that's the origin of sin, to covet and desire, both spiritually and naturally. But then we can develop a godly attitude in ourselves and our productivity to work. You know, I would teach my students, I would say, we'd, do the, we'd say this for the younger children, we love to work. And of course, they would roll their eyes and look at me. And I said, you love doing your homework, reading your assignments, and doing this because Labor is good. It's powerful. That's a biblical concept. It needs to be re-ingrained in our hearts and our minds and given to our children. Because in America today, we're starting to hate to labor and to work. And without that work ethic, things are being taken over and the vacuums being filled by greater civil control. But then we learn to cultivate wealth that can be passed on to our children that can appreciate in value. Lands, houses, they usually appreciate in value. And we invest, everyone should invest a portion in silver or gold. It's going to be the most valuable commodity. Now, you don't invest everything because you can't eat it. But the point is, you that which you're going to be able to maintain, you invest in it. And then you share what you've learned with at least one other person who has not taken this course. I mean, think about it. We'll talk a lot more about it next week. But the idea is, what can you do to simply spread these? We're going to have these um, videos available in different forms, not just online. 
And uh, we're going to uh, hope and pray that we all can begin to do this. So as you reread this lesson 13, uh, look at chapters 16 and 17 if you're using the paperback book, the newsletter that's being sent out to you on property. Um, you'll ponder the PowerPoint slides and all. Uh, this is something that we all can do to share with other people. And though I don't want to go into greater detail with these, these principles, I think these things have become fairly clear, clear enough to be able to share them with other people. 